So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Alessandro Giusti. I am a, a senior researcher at the Dallemolle Institute for Artificial Intelligence, which is uh, an institute here in Lugano, affiliated with both UZI and SUPSI universities. So this talk is a, a quick practical introduction to convolutional neural networks for image classification. Um, it doesn't really assume any uh, real background knowledge about machine learning. I hope it will be useful and understandable to most, uh, most of you. So uh, the idea is to use deep neural networks as image classifiers. Uh, and image classification is a task where you are given an image as input and you want to predict something about the image. And in terms of classification, we mean that we want to find which class the image belongs to. Now, everything I do today is available online on a GitHub repository. I think it will be uh, possible to link otherwise, but it's also at uh, this link in case you, uh, I don't know, you fear you will not be able to find it later. Uh, anyway, it's, uh, f you can find it on my GitHub. Just Google for my name. So um, this is a, we will treat this mostly as a black box during this talk. We are not gonna look into this too much, just a little bit. Um, you, my, my main message is that you don't really have to understand this uh, in detail in order to take advantage from it. You just need to understand very well the input, which is just image intensity values, so like a grid of numbers, basically and the output, which is class probabilities. So one big advantage of using deep neural networks for this compared to traditional techniques is uh, that we don't have to compute features, meaning that um, we, we don't have to think ourselves about what is important in the input image. The deep neural networks finds it by itself. So the process, uh, if somebody is not very familiar with machine learning, is very simple. First you gather your data. You know that in machine learning, we first train a model and then we use it. So in order to train a model, we need a data set uh, with labels. So we first gather this data set, then we split training data and testing data. Uh, then we train our model using the training data only, and then we evaluate our model on the testing data that the model has never seen. This is crucial and very important. We are gonna do this on a simple task, uh, which is classifying images of rock, paper, scissors, of hands, basically, uh, in their respective class. So it, this is a three class classification problem. Um, well, we have many images, right? Um, we first collect them. We are not gonna do it here, even though uh, this activity you find on GitHub is designed to uh, also uh, cover the data set acquisition process. Then we split it, this is super important, in one training set and one testing set. Then we take our neural network, we use the training set to train it, and while we train the neural network, we monitor its performance. We monitor how accurate it is on the training set, and we will see that it becomes very good. The accuracy becomes almost 100%, um, which, as we will see, is uh, quite obvious and not particularly interesting. What we care about is the accuracy of the neural network on the testing set. We want to train something that works well on images that it has never seen. This accuracy will be lower. So, um, in order to implement this, we will use Keras. Keras is a high-level Python library for uh, training deep neural networks. This is one of the most used uh, libraries. I think it's probably the most used high-level library for Python at least. And Python itself is the de facto standard for machine learning research. Uh, also for some deployments, but uh, most of the research actually happens in Python. Then um, Keras is built in such a way to be backend agnostic. So it, Keras doesn't directly handle all the operations, all the processing, uh, which is basically pro processing on tensors, which are 
big matrices, basically, multi-dimensional matrices. So in order to do that, it uses a backend. The backend may be TensorFlow, maybe Tiano, uh, maybe CNTK, which is a toolkit for uh, neural networks built by Microsoft. The idea is that if you build something on Keras, you don't see those details. And that's also an advantage because you can switch from one platform to another without big, big problems. Okay, um, well, uh, I just said this. And one of the advantages of Keras uh, over, for example, TensorFlow is that since it's higher level, we write fewer lines of code. Um, so for applications, it's really the way to go. Of course, the, 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 the con is that it's not as flexible as using directly TensorFlow, assuming that you know how to use it because it's a complex uh, tool. Uh, but in case you need more f flexibility, you can always access the backend directly. But this, this is advanced, uh, which and, uh, we don't really care about it right now. Okay, so uh, now it's time to uh, try this, let's call it experiment, okay? So um, I'm going here, and this is an instance of the Jupyter Notebook, which is a uh, environment for Python for coding and documenting your code and uh, showing it also as slides and so on. So I will skip this. Uh, so you will find this, this notebook online. Uh, if you go, want to go through it, all the explanations are also written in text but I'm going to skip most of this. The idea is that uh, we define uh, three classes. W class zero will be rock, class one will be paper, class two will be scissors. And the first step is that we have to build a data set. We don't do it now, we do like a bit like in the cooking shows where everything is already uh, in the oven. Um, however, we built this uh, ourselves, it's not a benchmark that you d just download it from the internet. Yeah, now you can download it from the GitHub repository, uh, but the idea is that we just gave to students uh, which come maybe to our lab in order to uh, see some demos and so on. Uh, we just gave them the task to acquire some of these images. We gave them these instructions. Take a picture of your hand and the hand of some of your colleagues. Um, not just students, some of them are actually also, uh, you know, managers or whatever. I mean, a lot of different people to which we have shown this activity. Uh, we just gave them this instruction. Try not to be too close or too far from the hand. It should be more or less at this distance, as in this beautiful picture. Um, but also try to be as representative as possible. This is an important uh, topic, when you build a data set for mach machine learning, you want the data set to be as varied as possible. If we build all the data set, all the pictures, we shoot them in this room, for example, then the neural network that we will train will work very well in this room. And as soon as we go out, it's different light, different shadows, different backgrounds, and it will not work anymore. So um, those who built this data set uh, had to take a lot of care in uh, trying to shoot pictures as different as possible. Right hands, left hands, um, young people, older people, males, females, and being an informatics department, that was also a bit of a problem. So um, let's just read the images. Now I will just execute the cell one line, uh, I mean one cell uh, at a time. I have uh, organized all of the pictures in a directory tree, uh, which is all under our datasets final here. You see that there are several uh, directories, D1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. They are all uh, acquired in different moments, so in different sessions, let's say. Okay? So it's different people taking pictures about different people in different environments. And for each of those environments, we have a directory with class rock, uh, another directory with class paper, and another directory with class scissors. Okay, so um, let's just look at one of those images just to understand one simple thing, which is that an image, once you load it, 
well, you, you all know this, right? An image is just a grid of pixels. And every pixel uh, corresponds to three numbers, red, green, and blue components of that color, okay? So um, when we load an image in Python, but in a, a programming language in general, we are dealing with a matrix uh, of numbers, and in particular, it's a matrix with three dimensions. Uh, sorry, uh, it, it does have three dimensions, sorry. It has 200 rows in this case, 200 columns, because we are resizing the images to be 200 times 200. And it has three channels. So the third dimension has three, uh, as, the, as length three, okay? And it has length three because uh, we have red, green, and blue. Okay, now we build a data set again uh, th this takes a little bit of time because we are basically reading all of our images from these directories and we are uh, saving them uh, in a data frame. It's basically a table. This table has uh, four columns, a column called file, which is basically uh, the, the, the file name, a column called label, which is zero, one, or two, which corresponds to the rock, paper, scissor, the, the, the ground truth, we call it, of that image. One column which contains the image itself, which we are reading right now, and also one column which, which contains a string, which is the name of the directory we read it from, d0, d1, d2, d3, d4, and so on. While we need, uh, why we need it, uh, it will be clear uh, in a short moment. So I will now just uh, sample uh, well, it's super small, but it's not really important. Uh, I just sampled three um, three lines of this big table that I built, uh, and you can see an example, right? Uh, we have the num the name of the directory. These uh, these are three lines at, at random, right? Uh, name of the directory, the file, uh, and the image, uh, which is a big matrix of numbers. These are uh, integers, basically. And then, of course, the label. This is a scissors, this is a also a scissors, and this is a paper, okay? Okay, now, um, it's very helpful. Every time you do anything with machine learning or also with data science or whatever, to always look at your data uh, step by step. And this is what we are doing now. I just fired up a tool which allows me to see a list of images. So these are the images in uh, our data set. So these are the images corresponding to the different rows. Um, and you can see there are many. In total, let's see, we have uh, 2,400. Actually, there are more than the last time I have shown this. Um, 2,400 images. Uh, more or less, one third is rock, one third is paper, one third is scissors. What we really care here is that people doing this uh, did a really good job at being as varied as possible in terms of background, in terms of lighting, in terms of angles. Some of them are also a bit nasty. Uh, many people like to do the Spock thing, others do uh, ambiguous things like this. It's okay. We we keep it, we keep them in the data set. We don't expect to get 100% accuracy. Also because this is a data set, uh, like a toy data set in some way. We, it it probably requires a few hours to acquire if you are a couple of motivated people and you have access to many uh, many people to shoot pictures of. We have to close this to continue. Okay. Okay. Now. Um, this step, uh, so preparing the training and testing data, is a key step for any machine learning pipeline. So now we have to take our data set and divide the images that we will use for training our network and the images we will use for uh, checking whether it works well or not, which, mean, which is called testing. If we just take a random subset of our images, um, it's not actually the best idea. Because in that case, we will um, 
overestimate the accuracy of our network. And the reason is that we will train on some images and in the testing set we will have images which are very similar. Maybe somebody sh shot two pictures in almost the same moment. Both of them have a blue background. Both of them are a, gu a guy doing a scissors uh, gesture. And then the neural network will learn, oh, okay, well, the blue background means scissors, which is actually not true. So um, in this case, we are making a mask and we are saying here, look, wherever my image has been acquired during a session, let's call it D7, then I want it to be in the testing set. And we place the testing set in this uh, table called dataset TE. Okay, I will run it. And everything else, so this is just a difference, all of the uh, images in my original table which are not those in the testing set, well, we, we can use them for training. So if we do this, we obtain a division, I hope it's, uh, you can read it, like this. So it's more or less 600 uh, training images for each of the three classes, which we like, it's quite balanced, and 170 uh, images for each of the testing. Uh, I mean, for, for testing for each of the classes. It's a, a good uh, data set. Now, in, on this data set, if you just guess at random, I give you an image, you guess without looking at it. The accuracy you can achieve is 33%, right? More or less, a bit more maybe, but it's more or less 33%. I keep this in, in mind. Now we have to decide what our neural network will take as inputs because we defined an image which is 200 pixels times 200 pixels. And um, well, it looks like this. So one, one of my image, uh, images is a matrix that has three dimensions. The first is 200, the second is 200, the third is three, and it's integers. If we look inside, it, it will be this huge you know, matrix that's represented like this. But just imagine this is uh, 200 times 200 times three numbers, uh, asking our neural network to classify images that are so big is a huge task. So uh, the question is, uh, do we need s such a high, relatively high resolution in order to classify our images? Most probably we don't. Actually deciding what we feed to the neural networks is important. So we just say, okay, let's just scale our images down. Uh, this function will just, uh, well, the uh, actual line of code here is this one, will just resize my image to a size of S, Z rows and the same number of columns. Okay, so I will just call this function transform and go ahead to here. Now, uh, what should be S, Z? So this number, this magic number of uh, rows and columns, well, uh, it should be the minimum number of rows and columns uh, for my image, the, the lowest resolution that still allows me to understand what the class is. The reasoning here is that if we can do that with our brain, we can expect our neural network to do that. If we can't, uh, maybe we, we shouldn't expect the neural network to do that. Okay, so uh, two times two uh, is most probably not enough. Right, so we can try maybe 11 times 11. This is an example, and uh, this is a little bit better. It allows me to see that this is probably paper, this is probably scissors, this also is scissors, this is, I don't know, this is paper, this is probably a rock. Well, we can actually know if we want. Th this can be also run as uh, you know a game where people get prizes when they uh, get the correct resolution, like the best resolution. Well, the idea is that uh, with this you can uh, try many, right? You, you could try 16 or 17. Uh, well, I cannot, uh, yes, here it is. 16 times 16 looks uh, reasonable. Most of them I can see, but uh, uh, here the, the limited resolution, for example, doesn't really allow me, uh, for this one, for example, I would not say it's paper, I would say it's scissors. Um, so it's not maybe the best, uh, so we will go with 32. 
our images will look like this. And we are quite convinced that this is enough, but it is not too much, right? From 200 to 32, but we are reducing a lot the number of numbers that our neural network will get as input, which means that we are reducing the dimensionality of the space in which the neural network will have to do its job. So we are moving from a space which is a 200 times 200 times three dimensional, which is a huge amount of dimensions. You can imagine that one image is represented by a point in that high dimensional space to uh, a space which is much, much smaller, even though it's still huge. So the number of numbers I, I give to my neural network is still a lot, but uh, it, it should work, okay. Now, um, I build a function like this, a sample function, is a function which takes one image at random from a table. So this is just a sample one image at random. Now, L will be the label of that image, which will be zero, one, or two. I am will be the image corresponding to that row. And then I transform the image by resizing it and making it smaller. And I return both the image and the label. This is the core of any machine learning pipeline. You need some way to get data, right? My image and my the, the label corresponding to that image. Then uh, our neural network will not process one image at a time. It will process a batch of images. A batch uh, is actually a set, right? Uh, it will be probably 32 at a time or whatever. This make batch is just returning, instead of a single pair image label, it's just returning n pairs image label, right? It's not doing anything fancy. And then generator is, uh, well, this is an advanced uh, Python functionality, uh, advanced and uh, not, not super advanced, um, which just, it's just an object which returns batches as long as uh, we want, right? It's uh, an infinite cycle. Where when, when we uh, ask for a new batch, we ask the generator and it will give, me, give us a new batch. So let's, uh, well, I have to define this, yeah. And then let's have a look at how one of those batches looks like. Maybe let's say we want a batch of two images and each image must be 32 times 32 pixels. So the result, uh, well, 32 times 32 is too much. Let's say three times three or two times two, even better. Ah, okay, so it fits my whole uh, screen. Okay, so we go, uh, what we got here is um, a tuple of two things. The first thing is a pair of images which is the first image and the second images. They, they are just two matrices. And the second thing we get is a pair of vectors, which are either, like they are binary, either one uh, or zero. And it's a, this is actually called one hot encoding. Uh, so for each of those two images, these booleans tell us whether it's a rock, a paper, or a scissors. In this case, both images we generated are rock images, but they are super small. We would not be able to solve the problem. What we will provide our neural network with is actually images that are 32 times 32. So much, much, much more data, but exactly the same labels, right? Now it's sampled them in a different way. So the first one is paper and the second one is rock. Okay, um, let's just visualize some of those images. So if I ask my function to generate a batch of 100 images, they look like this, okay? There are images of each type. They are all, they all have a resolution 32 times 32 pixels and uh, that's it. Okay, let's go on. And let's have a look, quick look inside this black box because we have to build it now. So uh, we will use Keras, so I import the important things, and I just show you very quickly uh, how to build a neural network with Keras. This is not a neural network that is suitable to uh, eat images yet, okay? It will not, uh, it, uh, this is a neural network that maps uh, a vector of three numbers to a vector of two numbers. 
For example, it could be classifying a point in space, which is X, Y, Z, in true or false, okay? And it's doing that through an hidden layer. So we just say, look, this is a sequential uh, neural network because also there are other more complex types of neural networks that are not uh, sequential. Uh, this is the simplest type of neural network. And we say, look, the first layer, and by the way, by layer we mean all of these arrows, basically. The first layer is building four neurons, which is these four, which corresponds to this hidden layer. It's building those four neurons from an input of three neurons. And then we add another layer after that, which is uh, giving you two neurons from the previous four. So in total, this neural network is learning to map these three numbers to these two numbers. And by learning, exactly what are we, uh, what are we doing when we learn a neural network? We are um, learning the weights. The weights are the numbers uh, associated to each of these arrows. In total, we have three times four, which is 12 arrows on this layer. Then, um, so we have uh, 12 numbers plus four numbers which are called bias. Uh, it's actually not particularly important in this case, uh, which then is a 16, plus four times two, which is eight, plus two numbers for the bias. So in total, I expect to have 16 uh, plus 10 parameters. So when we are learning this neural network, where we, when we are training it, we are basically uh, finding those numbers, okay? Let's see if uh, this is correct. 26 in total, that's uh, 16 in the first layer and 10 in the second layer, okay? As, as we expected. This is the total number of parameters that we are going to train when we learn this model. Okay, this model uh, takes as input three numbers and these three numbers can represent an image which has three pixels, each of which is gray. It's not exactly what we have in our case. So in our case, uh, since uh, we are doing it, um, like we are not looking in too much into the model uh, learning part, we have a little bit more complicated model, which I'm not going through. I just give you an intuition about what this model uh, is doing and uh, what is its shape. Okay, I probably have to run this. Uh, so this defines a function, make model, which is parameterized uh, by a number of filters. So it tells me how powerful this neural network is. The good news is that uh, this part is actually not important. M many people that are starting to do deep learning are scared because they don't know which architecture to choose. This is the architecture. This is the definition of the architecture. The good news is that you can just take an architecture you find uh, in the literature or an architecture you find online and try to use it. And most of the times it will just work. Actually, this is an architecture that we used in 2011, 2012 to do f some experiments on biomedical images. And then we used it for to, to do many other things. Okay, so um, this model, when I train it, um, it has in total 56,000 numbers to learn. So it's actually pretty big. The shape of the model is more or less like this, even though the numbers are different. So don't, don't look at the numbers, actually. Uh, let's look at this, which doesn't have uh, so many numbers. We have our, our image here. Then we, when we go deeper in the neural network, so we go layer after layer, we are reducing the number of pixels in this image, but we are increasing the number of channels. So at the beginning we have three channels, RGB, and then while we go uh, more in de depth of the network, we increase the number of channels up to 1024, which is actually, in our case, it's less than that. And then we put a few fully connected layers. Again, don't worry, this is not important for uh, our application. Let's just um, train this network. Okay, even if we don't completely understand its architecture. 
When we train a neural network, we need to monitor its training. We cannot just train it blindly. In order to monitor its training, we uh, have to have, we call it validation data or testing data. So we have uh, some data which has the same shape as uh, the training batch that I uh, showed you before, on which we test whether our neural network is actually learning or not. I put it in these two variables. X means the images and Y means the answers, so the, uh, the, the true classes associated to each of those images. And then we just start learning. Okay, so this line, uh, actually the, the line that trains the neural network is just this. So we build the neural network here, and then we train the neural network with this line of code. Um, we pass this data in such a way that after each epoch, so after every time the neural network sees all of our training data, it will check, just check without learning anything, uh, whether on this data is performing well or not. So we start from this point. At the first epoch, it took five seconds to look at all our 2,400 images. The loss is the amount of errors it, it is making. And the accuracy is how good it is. So which percentage of the inputs uh, it's, it's actually giving a correct answer for. So the loss starts more or less at one, and the accuracy starts at 33%, which we expect. So this is the stupid network. It didn't learn yet anything yet. And in fact, it's uh, basically like uh, trying to answer random stuff. And it gets it right one third of, of the times. While, uh, well, now it's taking five seconds per epoch or four seconds per epoch. So as you can see, the accuracy is actually increasing. You never look at those numbers uh, in practice. Uh, instead of looking at those numbers, you use uh, tools like TensorBoard, which is, yeah, uh, which is a tool which shows those data as a graph. Okay, so this is the accuracy and the loss on the training data while our neural network is training. As you can see, the accuracy is going up it's actually already 80% accuracy. That's actually uh, very good. And the loss is going down. The goal of the network is to get the loss at zero. And the loss is the best way to evaluate whether the neural network is learning or not. So we should be really happy. But this is the accuracy and the loss on the training data on those uh, 2,000 images, more or less, uh, that the network is seeing once and again and again and again. And now it is 90% accurate on those, and in actually it's 95, 97% accurate. So what may be happening is that the network is actually just learning by heart what, you, what is the answer for each of those images. For, for example, it may be seeing, oh, look, there is a pixel uh, that is bright. When, the, when I see a pixel bright on the top left, it's uh, scissors, because there is one image in the training set for which that is true, and this, is, this allows it to get an accuracy that is perfect on the training data. So we don't really care about the accuracy on the training data. We do care about the accuracy on the validation or testing data. That's basically the same thing, which is in these graphs. And as you can see, it has increased. It started also from 30%, but instead of getting to 100, it is now at 50%, which is better than chance. So we did learn something, right? But remember, the accuracy is not particularly important. We care about the loss, which should go down, should be as low as possible. And look what's happening. The loss is actually going this is a phenomenon called overfitting. It means that our neural network is really learning uh, in useless details about the training data, which are not general enough. When you apply them to uh, the testing data, which the network has never seen yet, 
they don't mean anything. And it makes the network wrong er and even more wrong. So it means that this network is not actually learning uh, at all, or almost. So uh, we, we can also stop it because it's actually useless. Uh, wait a moment. Stop the training. Okay, um, so what's the solution at this point? The solution could be to get a lot more training data, right? Instead of uh, having uh, uh, 200, uh, uh, 2,000 images, I probably need 20,000 images or 200,000 images, which is a bit of a sad, uh, uh, I mean, a sad conclusion, right? There is another solution, which is smarter, of course, uh, and uh, it is called data augmentation. So data augmentation means that if I take a picture of my hand like this, and this is a paper, what if I rotate it 90 degrees? It's still an image of paper, but for the neural network, it's completely new. It's a completely new uh, instance, right? I can do a lot of things, and I already implemented a function that does them. Um, let me check where it was, it was here, okay? So this function, instead of just resizing my image down to 32 times 32 pixels, is also transforming it. It's scaling it a little bit up or a little bit down. It's rotating it, it it's translating it a little bit. I can actually show you uh, the results. Uh, I have to run again this, and then I can show you one single image from our training set. So this image, this is a rock. We took it just once, it took five seconds to acquire this image. So far we just used this one. And we said to the network many times, oh, this is rock, this is rock, this is rock. Oh, every, every, every epoch we were training the network. Now, every time we show this to the network, we change it in a different way. So this is another uh, variation. This is again another. So all of these are obtained from the same input by just applying random rotation, scaling, a bit of color balance uh, variations. And this helps our neural network to learn better. Now, uh, I will, since we don't have so much time, I will just run again the training. But this time, Now, this time, while we are training the neural network, we will actually see this as um, a second number here, I guess. Okay, wait, I have just to update this. Okay, perfect. Okay, so this new line that is coming up is the neural network we are training now using this technique called data augmentation. It also started from, okay, wait, let's look at the training accuracy like now, like before. It started from the same place uh, where we started before, more or less 33% accuracy. But uh, this time it will evolve in a different way. So while we wait for this neural network to train, I will show you a couple of slides about other stuff that you can do exactly in the same way. It's actually a matter of uh, a few minutes, also because we don't have much more. And I show you one um, application of neural network that we developed in our institute uh, some time ago with uh, also some uh, students, where we learned to fly a quadrotor to follow forest trails. So, um, this is a drone, and the idea is that we want it to just uh, using its frontal camera to follow a, a trail in the forest. So if you want to do this uh, with a robot, because and that's because we do robotics, right? If you want to build a, ro a robot that is uh, very good at doing this job, you have to solve a lot of problems. You have to find how to see 
the direction of the trail, you have to make maybe a map, make sure that you avoid obstacles. We don't care about most of those things. We just care about uh, seeing whether we can understand where the trail is heading from the picture. And these are some pictures that we get. So if you go in the forest, you actually take pictures uh, when you are walking on a trail, you see pictures like this. And as humans, interpreting these pictures is not easy, right? Um, the, the question that we ask is, given this picture, for example, can you tell whether the trail is going left, is going straight ahead, or is going to the right? Now, for the answer for this picture is that on the le left pictures, the trail is heading left, which, by the way, is impossible to see here. Um, in the center image, the train is going straight ahead, and on the right image, is the, train, the trail is going to the right. Can the, the real answer is, the, the real question is, can we train a neural network to understand this? And the nice thing is that you can do that exactly with the approach that we have shown now. So uh, we take the image, we train our deep neural network, and it will tell us, instead of rock, paper, scissors, it will tell us whether the trail is going left, is going straight ahead, or is going to the right. When you evaluate those uh, classifiers, you do that using a thing called um, misclassification metrics or confusion metrics, which tells you uh, of all the images that have a given class, how many were classified, were predicted with the same class. And you want to have a matrix that is as uh, close to a diagonal matrix as possible. All the uh, images that end up in out of the diagonal are errors. So what we have seen after training our neural network is that they actually work uh, very well and they get the answer correct most of the times. I will show you a very quick video which shows the, the drone uh, in action. I should actually skip the introduction and just show you the uh, smart thing that we did uh, in, this, uh, in this case. So the, the question, if you want to build such a neural network, uh, the question is how do you build the training set? You need a lot of pictures uh, where the trail is either left, center, or right. And the answer that we gave, which is a smart idea, actually I still think that's uh, the, the uh, the really nice idea that we have is that we just sent one uh, colleague uh, hiking on the trails with the three GoPro cameras mounted on his head. One camera was looking forward, one camera a bit to the left, and one camera a bit to the right. So all the images acquired by the camera that is looking to the center have the trail in their center. So all of the images acquired by this camera can be given the ground truth label, the trail is in the center. All the images from the left camera have the trail on the right, and all the images on the right camera has, have, the train, uh, have the trail on the left. So in this way, in just a few hours of hiking, we acquired 20K images. By the way, the dataset is also online and available if you want to play with it. And this is how it works when I use my cell phone to just look uh, left and right. So here I was just walking and uh, waving my cell phone left and right, and on the bottom you can see the answers of our neural network. After we saw that this neural network was giving uh, nice results, we let this neural network drive the drone. So we just said, okay, now uh, the drone should just follow whatever the neural network says. And here you, you see the first person view of the drone and on the bottom, you see the outputs of the neural network. We actually didn't do any real work on how to control this in an efficient way. We were happy enough that it was uh, following the trail, even though it was going a little bit like uh, a snake. Uh, it was not really, really efficient. Um, but the, the, the outcome was that by using this very simple approach, and this uh, smart idea for acquiring in an efficient way the training data, we could get a result that uh, is actually uh, very cool. Um, we, um, th th the nice thing is that this works 
in real trails. So the, the images that you get uh, in the real world are much harder than the images you can shoot uh, if you like if if you s artificially make your problem simpler. So if you go on a road and uh, like on a trail that is very bright on a uniformly green background, then the problem is easy. In these uh, cases with the sun, with the shadows and whatever, the problem was actually very hard. So I, we have the last few minutes of the talk. So let's see what's happening because we have a few important things to learn now. So uh, remember the, the neural network we were training before is this one, the one on, on the top. So the accuracy during the training, so this is the accuracy over the training data is going up. Uh, in with the previous network, where when we were not using uh, data augmentation, the accuracy was reaching 100% uh, almost immediately. Now it's increasing, but it's increasing much slower. And if we look at the loss, which is the real uh, measure that we care about, well, the loss is decreasing, but it's decreasing now much slower than it was decreasing before. This is not intuitive, uh, but it is good. So uh, the reason why this is in decreasing slower is that it cannot cheat anymore. So before it only had 2,000 images to learn, and it had learned them very quickly, just in uh, 20, 30, 40 steps. It had learned all of the, the answers to all of them perfectly, which is exactly what we don't want it to do. We want it to learn a general uh, criteria which hopefully apply also on images that it has never seen before. So now on the training data, our new network is learning much slower and it actually needs more time. It actually really needs much more time to, to become uh, effective. Uh, on the testing data, as you can see, before we could get to uh, 50% and now the accuracy reaches 75% which is not bad given the training set that we have. And in particular, you can see that now the loss is not increasing anymore on the testing data. It's going down as it should. If we leave it running for longer, it will improve, but we actually don't have to leave it running for longer. We can now uh, get the, uh, no, we, I don't, it's not necessary that they save or uh, read this model. I will just apply this model on some testing data because this is the real uh, proof we need at the end. This is an image that the network has never seen before. This is the input that the network gets and this is the output that the network gives us. It's actually very small, I'm sorry, but uh, believe me, it says rock paper and scissors. This is a bar graph and it shows that according to the network this is 70 percent, uh, it's 70 percent sure that this is a rock, which is true, which is correct. Of course one image doesn't really mean anything, we have to do this on many images and uh, well this is another and it is 60 uh, percent sure that it is scissors. This, this counts as correct because this is the highest uh, probability. Normally we take the maximum probability, right? This is difficult, but it is actually 100% sure it's rock, which is good. This is 100% uh, sure it's scissors. Scissors, so actually I want an error because else it's not interesting. This one, uh, well, it is un unsure whether it's rock or scissors, but it's actually correct in giving more confidence to rock. This is really difficult and in fact it, it gets it wrong. It gets it wrong. Uh, so you see that the true class is a scissors, but the answer is uh, most probably it's paper. There is a little probability that it's scissors. So um, sometimes it gets it wrong, which is understandable. It's sure it's paper. This one is uh, nasty, honestly. <laughs> Whoever took this picture was, uh, uh, was a bit nasty. Uh, so it is classified as rock and maybe scissors, whereas it's scissors. But still the behavior of the, of the neural network, as you can see, is this is exactly the neural network we trained right now, okay? So the behavior is 
more or less what we expect, another error, finally. And the reason for this error is that here the, the hand is much farther away than the network ex expected. We basically are out of time, so I will just show you the last thing as, um, so we, we now take this neural network and apply it on webcam data. Uh, hopefully in full screen. Wait, I just have to. No? Uh, let's see. Okay. So, well, um, as you can see in real time, the uh, outputs of the neural network are here. And if I put my hand, see? They uh, adapt, scissors, rock, paper, scissors, okay? So as you can see, it's not 100% sure most of the times. It's actually a difficult situation. If I put my face, it's rock, okay? Um, I, I will leave it running here if you want to uh, try it. And I think uh, this is all because we are out of time. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks.